Hello, and welcome to my talk, Deconstructing the Hadza Curse, Language Work as Work in Transformation. There is a legend among linguists that anyone who undertakes work on the Hadza language is doomed to fail. Provoked by this bizarre story, this talk uses the Hadza curse as an entry point for a critical intervention in the relationship between researchers and the Hadza people, between traditions of Hadza scholarship and epistemic violence, as well as between language work and the transformative work of allowing the Hadzabe people to valorize, speak for, and represent themselves. Very early on, it will be established that the Hadza curse is due to factors external to the Hadza people, and is a myth. Attention will then duly turn from imagined threats faced by linguists to the real violence faced by the Hadzabe people. The talk will assert that the end to violence against the Hadzabe people is rooted in changing how they are portrayed to outsiders, and especially through challenging existing research practices. Recent cases of language work with the Hadzabe people are given as examples of what some of these transformations can look like. For a quick note on data, a recording of this talk will be archived and made available online, both at Zenodo through the DOI on screen, as well as on the YouTube page, which can be accessed by scanning the QR code on screen. I will be using QR codes occasionally throughout this talk, so if you are interested, please do feel free to scan these with your smartphones as we go along. For a bit further context about me, my work in language documentation began in 2012 during my master's studies at the University of Dar es Salaam, where I began making recordings of the Gorwa language as part of my dissertation. This continued on and off through my doctoral studies at SOAS, during which I continued working with Gorwa, essentially making most of the decisions regarding the documentation on my own in a classic outsider-led documentation format. Things changed around 2017 when myself and my Gorwa colleagues decided to try something new. Instead of me going around with the camera and the recording device, we decided that actually training Gorwa speakers themselves to conduct this work would not only be more efficient, but would also result in a richer documentation. So from this point essentially to present, the Gorwa language documentation project continues with Gorwa speakers themselves not only producing the recordings, but deciding who to interview, what to talk about, and how to go about exploring their histories, languages, and cultures. This insider-led approach was really a turning point in my documentary praxis, and basically all documentations I've been a part of have been insider-led projects since that point. In 2019, I began a similar insider-led project documenting Ihanzu, spoken in the same region of Tanzania, which we often call the Tanzanian Rift Valley. And in the same year, my colleague Richard Griscom and I began an ELDP-funded project documenting the Hadza language, spoken nearby to where Gorwa and Ihanzu are spoken in central Tanzania. For some additional context, Hadza is spoken primarily in an area of north-central Tanzania that I refer to as the Tanzanian Rift. Hadza communities, the approximate locations of some of which I've marked here on this map as blue dots, surround Lake Eyasi, especially to the south, but with an area which has in recent times become somewhat isolated from the other Hadza communities located to the northwest. Genetically speaking, the Hadza language was once considered part of the so-called Khoisan language phylum, linking it to the non-Bantu languages which employ phonemic cliques and which are spoken much further to the southwest of the African continent. Today, not only do most linguists who study so-called Khoisan languages believe that Khoisan is not a coherent genetic unit, but convincing arguments have been made that Hadza is best seen as a language isolate, genetically related neither to any of the languages from so-called Khoisan nor any other language. Regarding language use and attitudes toward the language, I'd like to say that this is a complex and important topic and deserves considerably more attention and nuance than I've provided on this slide. For those of us who are interested in a bit more detail, I'd encourage you to read a report of a workshop held in 2018 in which some Hadza speakers, among speakers of other languages, shared thoughts about their language, the changes it is undergoing, and prospects for the future. This can be accessed by scanning the QR code currently on screen. 
A first detail that we might notice is that there is huge variation in estimates for the number of people who speak Hadza. Work by anthropologist Nicholas Blurton Jones provides a figure of 1,000, and work by the Languages of Tanzania Project gives more than 6,000. My colleague Richard Griscom and I, based on our documentary work, have a feeling that the figure is probably something around 2,000. In virtually all cases, uh, Hadza people of all ages, including the youngest children, continue to use Hadza. But it is important to recognize that though the Hadza people continue to use and transmit their language, the speaker community, as a small population which lacks access to health care, education, and political representation, and many of whom rely on the resources of a fragile forest ecosystem, the threats facing the Hadzabe people and their language are significant and existential. Most Hadza speakers recognize that the way they speak is markedly different from other languages of Tanzania, and my impression is that there is a considerable amount of pride in its use, both as a medium through which, through which Hadza culture and everyday life is transmitted, and also as a code maintaining and establishing this sparsely populated community across a relatively large geographical area. At the same time, it's not uncommon to encounter Tanzanians from other ethnic groups who believe that Hadza is simply not a language. I'd like now to play a brief clip of the Hadza language so that we can both get a sense of how the language sounds and how it looks. This particular recording was made as part of the Hadza documentation project and is part of a conversation between local researcher Bunga Paolo on the left and Ate Pandisha on the right. And here they talk about taboos, particularly associated with hunting. So, in addition to these details about the Hadza language, there exists an additional feature of Hadza that commonly comes up in its discussion, especially among people who document and describe languages. So much so, in fact, that it has become a persistent rumor, and that is that the Hadza language is cursed. Discussion of the Hadza curse has basically been confined to dinnertime conversation, so it is hard to determine how, when, or where the concept arose. This formulation is uh, in a guest blog post by Harold Hammerstrom on the Endangered Languages Archive blog in 2019, and it seems to be the earliest written reference. It is, however, by no means the first time I'd encountered talk of the Hadza curse, and it is not the only way I've heard the curse formulated. So Hammerstrom words it like this, Hadza has a long history of documentation, but so far no extensive grammar has been published. Curiously, no student who has embarked on a PhD study of the language has come to a finish, as if a curse befalls those who try. Uh, but I've also heard it formulated as people who start work on Hadza never finish, or research on Hadza is plagued with misfortune, which results in linguists having to abandon the work. Now, at its worst, the Hadza curse is obscurantism, which echoes colonial concepts of otherness, similar to how early mapmakers would claim the unknown area was unknown because here be lions. Instead, and slightly more charitably tonight, I would like to view the Hadza curse as part of linguists' oral history of a shared endeavor, a way to articulate the recent history of linguistic work with the Hadza language. As a linguist who works with Hadza-speaking people, I feel like an exploration of this history is useful, both to test its accuracy, as well as to better contextualize how linguistic research relates to the Hadzabe today. And because so much of this history is unpublished, I decided that the best way to do this was to sit down with someone who has lived this history, Bonnie Sands. Bonnie Sands has been working with the Hadza language and speakers of Hadza since around 1991 and has been a great colleague and mentor to me as I've begun my own work with Hadza. 
Around a month ago, we connected on Zoom specifically to talk about the documentation and description of the Hadza language over the past 30 years, as well as to discuss the origins of the Hadza curse. What follows is a brief digest of some of what we discussed, along with some of her photos from her fieldwork. I started working on Hadza after a question that Ian Madison asked. He said, hey, did you know that there are click languages spoken in East Africa? And I was like, no. And would you be interested in working on them? And I was like, yes. <laughs> you know, you never think that you are creating history when you're doing this stuff. You just are living in the moment. And <laughs> With the insect words, we had this one that was very confusing because it was a, a plural form. And yet it was, Agudo said, no, it's just one thing. But I'm like, but why is it a plural? And then one day he found the insect and it was, processionary worms <laughs> they're a bunch of different worms and okay. they they climb over one another and they form a little line so they look like like a long caterpillar but when you look at it closely it's formed of a bunch of different worms so I'm like oh i understand it now you know that sort of stuff was really enjoyable and fun much more fun than just oh i've got one set word list i'm going to record these words 10 times with mm -hmm. different people i was much more interested in sort of getting some of these colorful you know words that aren't even necessarily going to be helpful for historical reconstruction but would be nice to have in a dictionary one day but yes this visiting was a much more extremely remote area with very little infrastructure support you know uh so all the risks of field work were much higher i think the nearest bank to Mangola was arusha and that was six hours down a very bumpy road all your payments for field work, all your buying your own food, all the buying the fuel, you had to be carrying that in cash. And so, yeah, it was really risky. So I would have, if I had gotten sick, it would have been harder to get me medical care as opposed to a place where people had a wireless radio, could have treated me almost immediately. There was, at Mangola, there was an airstrip where the flying doctors could come in, you know, Endamaga, you're just enough you know, it's still relatively close to Mangola, but, um, you know, just keeping, say, the Land Rover there, who would be guarding it, you know, there, there were just a lot more issues. Vehicle accidents are very common among field workers in Africa. The road was so bad. It was hours and hours of driving. She'd gotten into a terrible uh, vehicle accident, and he was poisoned by somebody on the bus. They had a rollover accident. If I if I try to go back to Tanzania, just just shoot me, <laughs> just shoot me. <laughs> if you look at people who do and don't finish PhD theses, some people just never finish because they get other priorities in life. He was earning money, had a spouse. He didn't need a PhD at that point. Yeah. You get personal difficulties with just finishing things. You've got my situation, which I didn't write a grammar because I'm not interested in grammar that much. I have other things I, I'm more interested in working on yeah. than grammar. I'm not, yeah. I'm not a syntactician or a morphologist. So we can't put that on some grad student linguist that you're going to save this language. First of all, the, that language is problematic. But this idea that you're going to come and describe it, write a book. Linguists have to be more careful about community expectations. One linguist does not own a language that is colonialist, that is old. You cannot say that because how many people have worked on the grammar of English or the grammar of French? We don't have statistics on this. Out of people who go and do field work, how many get into car accidents? How many fall terribly sick? I mean, you know, we it, it's not something that you really see in the literature on linguistic field work, is it? Anecdotally, we had four examples. I think we can say there is an occurrence. Bonnie's thoughts offer some considerable clarification. The Hadza language has been difficult to research because of the larger context in which it is spoken. Two researchers were involved in serious traffic accidents, and long-term research days were rendered challenging by other factors such as poor access to healthcare facilities and money, etc. Uh, this is an illustrative image Richard took of me stuck in the mud as we traveled to Sungu in late 2019. Another factor which has made Hadza research difficult is the nature of academia itself. 
Much of the task of researching Hadza was placed on graduate students who we know are often new to this kind of work as well as enjoy much less support than more established academics. In this case, two researchers never finish their doctoral studies, the reasons being more associated with academia than the Hadza language or people. Finally, I'd like to add that the focus or even fixation on Hadza grammar as the only sort of valid research output has probably also played a role in prolonging the Hadza curse. As Bonnie mentioned, her doctoral work didn't result in a Hadza grammar because that was not the object of her individual inquiry. Instead, Bonnie's doctoral research resulted in a landmark work that shifted our understanding of the linguistic geography of Africa, establishing Hadza as an isolate rather than as a language of the so-called Khoisan phylum. I would therefore agree with Bonnie's concluding thoughts in the interview, no, there is no Hadza curse. So, a preliminary observation of this talk is that the Hadza curse, as commonly perceived, is really about recent histories of linguists and not any sort of dark force of which the language and people are possessed. And if this evening lecture were to end here, it would have been a great exercise in both setting up and knocking down a straw man. Instead, I would like now to look beyond the linguists and consider the actual cause for concern here, that of actual violence that has been visited on the Hadza people. I would like to submit now that even though linguists who work with Hadza have never suffered a curse, much recent research on the Hadza people is certainly as close to a curse on them as could possibly be imagined. My examples are from fields beyond linguistics, so I hope you will allow me a moment to look at some recent scholarly history. Hadza research is now well into its second century, with early accounts from explorers and colonial officials dating back over a hundred years. My colleague Richard Griscom and I provide a review of this history in a previous talk which can be accessed by scanning the QR code, which I'll leave on screen for the coming slide. For this talk, I'll focus more closely on work which has occurred over the past 40 years, give or take, as it is from around this time that we begin to see a trend in work with the Hadza which continues to present and which has had deep and, I would argue, damaging implications. Essentially, since around the 80s, much academic work about the Hadza people hinges on their usefulness as proxies for Paleolithic peoples. We can see this in this work from 1988, a study of Hadza scavenging practices which is then used to speculate on early hominid scavenging practices. This pattern continues in this 2017 work, which justifies working with the Hadzabe people because it is difficult to infer features of our ancestral microbiome. Here, we examine the gut microbiome profile from the Hadza hunter-gatherers of Tanzania. Comparison of the Hadza data set with other non-Hadza populations reveals that gut community membership corresponds to modernization. And finally, just last year, an article which compared energy use of Hadza people as they collected food stated that our results contradict any notion of the original affluent society, again, where data from the Hadza people are used to stand in for data on ancient people. This quote from this 2016 work is particularly succinct. In this author's view, the Hadza people do not experience history as such. So, throughout the 20th century, day by day, Hadza have little to adapt to but their environment and each other. Marlowe, in 2010, goes so far as to refer to the Hadzabe people as living fossils, arguing that societies that continue to hunt and gather with bows and arrows resemble the societies our ancestors lived in more than industrial societies do. This is an inescapable fact. Um, it feels rather incredible to me that I need to say this, but of course this is not so much an inescapable fact as a bold assertion, as are all the assertions in the research I have quoted above. Edmund Leach spoke since in 1982, reminding us that the hunter-gatherer societies of remote antiquity need not have resembled in the very least any of those which are now known to us from direct observation. Alas, this position is regularly ignored in this kind of work, and it is a commonly entrenched practice to frame work involving Hadza people as work with people who have, in many ways, remained unchanged. Returning to this 2016 work, it is stated that it seems reasonable to suppose that ancestors of the Hadza were living by hunting and gathering in the Aasi Basin for many tens of thousands of years. 
the Hadza are, in the eyes of many researchers, timeless. In his discussion of the so-called East African Khoisan, a presentation which can be listened to by following the QR code on screen, my colleague Matthew Nisley establishes that when a people's past is reconstructed as timeless, it effectively discourages investigation into their history and how they may have changed. I would take this a step further and suggest that such timeless peoples, having been denied their history, make incredibly convenient targets upon which to project any manner of bias or belief. So the Hadza have essentially become a Rorschach inkblot test. To an evolutionary anthropologist like Marlowe, this means that people like the Hadza are, for all intents and purposes, their ideal model of ancient humans. Marlowe goes on to tell us that because the Hadza are living fossils, it makes them interesting. It makes them valuable for evolutionary research, emphasis mine. Unfortunately, the value of the Hadza people has not gone unnoticed by individuals outside of academia, often who are much less concerned with the ethical implications of their actions and depictions of what is a vulnerable group of people. I would like to give a concrete example of this kind of exploitation, but I will also warn you that some of the dialogue you will hear is by all measures racist and uh, disturbing. Anthony Gustin here to the left of the screen and Paul Saladino here to the right of the screen are entrepreneurs in the style of celebrity doctors. Gustin is a chiropractor and Saladino, known as the carnivore MD, is a medical doctor. Both have considerable followings, celebrity connections, and most importantly, business interests built around fad diets encouraging eating mainly animal products and minimizing carbohydrates. Gustin peddles a range of low-carb supplements and is co-author of a popular book on the ketogenic diet. Saladino, meanwhile, is the author of a best-selling book on the carnivore diet and markets his own range of meat and organ-based pills, promising everything from better immune function to reinforced sexual health. They recently took a high-end tour to Tanzania, primarily to spend time with a group of Hadza people. Gustin and Saladino spent five days with the Hadzabe, ticking off all the boxes that would be offered to them as luxury tourists, gathering honey, spending time in a Hadza encampment, and accompanying a forest walk during which Hadza cult hunters killed, cooked, and ate a baboon. So elated with their good time, they immediately sought to share their privileged experience to their wide followings across social media. I'll take most of my examples from one podcast they recorded together. Gustin and Saladino do some considerable work to establish how natural and uncivilized the Hadza people are. This, accompanied by rudimentary observations made, I will remind you, over a five-day tour about the Hadza people's health and longevity, is employed to show that the Hadza way of life is healthier and overall better than a Western one. So we went to Tanzania, to Lake Yasi area, to stay with the Hadza tribe, which is one of the last remaining hunter-gatherer tribes known to man, staying with the Hadza tribe for, for five days. So when I was writing my book, The Carnivore Code, I was envisioning a time machine. I kept coming up against this book. I kept saying in the book, if I only had a time machine, if I only had a time machine, I would go back 50,000 years or 100,000 years to see what Homo sapiens looked like and how we were living. And we, we pretty much went back 30 to 40,000 years with a few glitches in the matrix. This is a, they're a very valuable window into the way that humans have lived for thousands, tens of thousands, perhaps millions of years. Here's a window to the past. Here is a time capsule. Here is a window which you and I were able to step through. Here is a doorway to the past. And what we find in the past is that they're, they're free from chronic disease. And the Hadza are fascinating because they are free from chronic disease. The Hadza are very healthy. They are free from um, chronic disease. My observations were at least that there were many members of the tribe who were elderly and quite spry, very vital. We have more here, more diabetes, more chronic disease, more stress, more divorce, more loneliness, more depression, more anxiety, more suicide. I mean, th these things just don't exist in, in this culture. Nobody we really saw there looked sad. I don't think depression exists when you're living that way. So we, don't, we weren't staying at the actual camp with them. We were staying maybe 30, 40 minutes away at this pretty nice lodge. It's actually shocked at how nice it was on Lake Yasi. 
And there we had, you know, breakfast and dinner that we could have, great meals. I'm not a physician, nor am I particularly interested in the details of Gustin and Saladino's nutritional arguments, but it is very clear that for Gustin and Saladino, their time with this group of Hadza people was for the purpose of legitimizing their lifestyle brands as well as to promote their products. I think that a lot of people in the paleo space um, like to talk about these people, but how many in the paleo space or the animal-based space or the carnivore space or the keto space have actually gone and lived with them. And if you look at the way the Hods are mostly eating, let's be very clear about this. It's mostly meat and organs with some berries occasionally, some baobab occasionally, some tubers occasionally, and honey when they can get it. And I think that it's very clear that that type of a diet leads them to a life that is essentially free of chronic disease. And that's valuable. And that's what I tried to create around an animal-based diet. We asked them, what do you dream about? They said, hunting. What's the best day of your life? Bringing back the biggest game for the tribe. What makes a good husband? Someone that is a successful hunter and brings meat to the tribe. It, it was all about meat. You know, what do you do when you're not hunting? They make arrows and they talk about hunting. It was, it was all about meat. They're an incredibly meat-centric society that the Hodges are a plant-based culture, which National Geographic has printed. It's completely false. They're so meat-centric. You know, they're eating animal foods as a primary source. They're eating most of the tail. All these things are the things that you and I talk about trying to do in our lives in Austin, Texas, or wherever we are. And most of the world around us is just retreating further and further from nature when you and I are, and many people that we know and people listening to this are trying to get further into it. I mean, I think we've, we've departed from nature so starkly. Uh, for them. So the Hadza have really, in my opinion, seem to say, we think it's more fun to be hunter-gatherers. We want to yeah. hunt. And we want to eat good food, which is kind of like you and me and why we do this stuff in the first place, you know? Like, why do you go hunting at Rome Ranch? Why do we seek out good food from regeneratively raised farms? Because it's fun, because the food is better. People who follow you, people who follow me, you know, those are today's modern hunter-gatherers. Like so very clearly, we can see that instead of terms like Hadza land rights, which they may have included if they were actually concerned with the well-being of the people they visited, attached to this video, we immediately see tags such as keto and weight loss. Further down on Gustin's version of this podcast are links to lines of low-carb powders. Saladino's version of this interview has even more links to things like his line of desiccated organ supplements and high-end farm products. After all of this talk, in which the Hadza people have been instrumentalized to sell diet pills and cuts of meat, they've been rendered so intrinsically alien that Gustin and Saladino, both doctors, I will remind you, make some astounding statements. These women basically go to a tree and squat and have a baby. And so infant mortality is higher, as it is among other species. I mean, chimpanzee, bonobo, infant mortality, I believe, is higher. So I think we just have to accept, though it's a little bit of an uncomfortable notion for me, that wild, quote unquote, humans may have higher levels of mortality. Yeah, I mean, this is the truth that nobody likes to talk about is that it is normal for most mammals to not have 100% of their infants survive into adulthood. And we've created an environment where our expectation is that is not normal. And so when we're confronted with anything that butts up against that, then we have this weird disconnect of, of we, we can't mentally grapple with it. I, I, get, I don't know if they would trade 100% infant success to adulthood to live, you know, a, a more Western lifestyle. I don't know. I don't know if they would. You know, question I got out lies, okay, if, if not so much like how do people die falling out of trees? So you're talking about yes. earlier, the guy who climbed up a tree 30 feet. In, in a matter of minutes, like, well, he can also follow that tree really easily. And that's, that's how they die. Yeah. yeah. So not only are Gustin and Saladino entirely unable to imagine the Hadzabe people as living their lives and being provided with adequate maternal health care, they also think it's acceptable to joke about Hadza people dying from falls from trees. The image evoked, that of their wild humans living in trees, is really directly from some of the most racist accounts of African people, and is honestly incredibly upsetting to hear. 
I could go on. Indeed, after their first two-hour-plus podcast, Gustin and Saladino do a second episode answering questions from their followers, including credulously talking about things like, do the Hadza smell, and do they masturbate? That two tourists felt that they could, after a five-day tour, use the Hadzabe people in such a cynical and undignified manner is deeply disturbing. But it is unfortunately not surprising. After all, Gustin and Saladino are only two unscrupulous business people seeing an opportunity for them to plug into a well-established tradition of misrepresentation and profit, that being rooted in the history of academic research on the Hadza people. This is not some sort of rhetorical flourish on my part. The connection is very direct, as these two quotes from Gustin and Saladino show. What were your intentions around this? I think a lot of people were asking questions to me on social. What's the big deal with the Hadza? Why would you go halfway across the world to study these people? We were chatting before the recording of this paper that you brought up of some research regarding the last remaining hunter-gatherer societies in the planet. We did the experiment. We, we did it. You know, we went back in time as best we could, and you see it all playing out in front of your eyes. So because of previous research on the Hadzabe, which has instrumentalized them as timeless and has denied them any sort of historical agency, they are the perfect targets for exploitation. They are as one sees them and nothing more. And because they have no history, no larger story of change beyond biology and evolution, five days of observation is enough to learn everything one needs. Gustin and Saladino's exploitation is as reprehensible as it is violent. It represents the worst logics of colonial capitalism. At the same time, however, it is really a distraction from the root cause which lies in another type of violence, this time carried out by researchers. This is epistemic violence, which Brunner defines as the very contribution to violent societal conditions that is rooted in knowledge itself, in its formation, shape, setup, and effectiveness. Epistemic violence is deeply embedded in our knowledge, as well as in the ways on which we strive towards it. It might seem an outrage to suggest that researchers' past approaches to the Hadza people has been violent, but this is precisely the nature of epistemic violence. Norman does a good job in characterizing it, saying, of course, the phenomenon in question would not ordinarily be thought of as violence. It is too respectable, too academic, too genteel for that. It is violence, all the same, and deserves to be seen for what it is. What I am saying is, by upholding research built on seeing the Hadzabe people as ancient humans, as analogs to ancient humans, or as otherwise timeless, not only do researchers render the Hadzabe people vulnerable to exploitation, but they also deny the Hadzabe people agency, cultural depth, and room for nuance. So, what do we do? In her monumental work on indigenous research methodologies, Bagele Chilisa suggests that researchers strive to become transformative healers. Now, as a white man working in an African context, I don't really feel that this is an identity I can credibly assume, but with that said, I do believe in the power, both provocative and transformative, of research. So I would, therefore, like to now induce a transformation by calling for it here and now. So we have seen clearly that the root of much current violence faced by the Hadza people is based in the way that they are portrayed by outside researchers. It is my conviction that if we change the face of Hadza research, we can also begin eliminating the violence visited on the Hadza people, which is based on this research. So I would call to change things as they are to things as they could be, from a picture of the Hadza that sees them as timeless, to a picture that sees the Hadzabe people as having history, full, dynamic, and complex. A paradigm which shifts from the value of the Hadzabe is linked to their value to outsiders, to one in which the value of the Hadzabe is inherent in their being human. And a shift from this model of the Hadzabe being spoken for, to one in which the Hadzabe themselves speak, that is, self-representation. Um, I'm giving this evening lecture to an audience of linguists, so the obvious question at this juncture is, 
what can linguistics do to bring about this change? And, well, the answer is nothing. Nothing until we recognize that linguistics is a pursuit intimately involving people, and resultantly, until we make the changes necessary to ensure that linguistics responds to the struggles, desires, and concerns of the people with whom we work. Here's a photo of three young Hadza people, Shalia Hassani, Mgana Lucas, and Ntume Juma, who are about to make a recording of what they see and do during a forest walk near the Hukumako camp in 2021. This kind of paradigm shift is best embodied in the term language work, which I first encountered in a talk given by Wesley Leonard in 2021, in which he establishes as an umbrella term, including things such as language learning, language development, and language documentation and description. The image of these terms here existing under an umbrella is done explicitly by Leonard in order to indicate that all of these things and others should be informed by and responsive to each other. I'd like now to suggest that adding another element under this umbrella of language work, that being linguistics itself. This might seem like an inversion to some of us, and to that I would say that this is precisely the point. Taking two components of language work, my new edition linguistics, and then language documentation and description, I would like to provide a brief example of how these kinds of language work can be transformational in the case of the Hadza people. I'd first like to talk about linguistics, specifically historical linguistics, in that through this we can see that contact with other peoples and change is a deep and regular feature of Hadza history and culture. Both examples I will give here come from the system of Hadza person number gender clitics, which in Hadza combine with lexical verbs, or sometimes do not, as in example three here, to express grammatical relations, but also with concepts including tense, aspect, and mood. For the set of auxiliaries which mark the so-called veridical tense, whose semantics indicate less certainty or a counterfactual, we can see a similar form in the auxiliary system of a nearby language, Nyaturu, this time used to mark far future. Furthermore, the forms Gwema and Kwema are verbs meaning to stand in nearby Bantu languages. This seems to suggest that this marker may have arisen in Hadza through contact with a Bantu language of the region. Note also the pronominal elements of the person gender number clitics of Hadza, some of which I've highlighted here. Across most of the paradigms, the pattern that emerges is that first person is marked by N, second person is marked by T, and third person is marked by S. This is strikingly similar to widespread patterns observed in the languages of the Afroasiatic phylum. Furthermore, though the N, T, and S are reconstructed for Cushitic, the second person T and the third person S are not reconstructed for Proto-West Rift, the branch of Cushitic that is currently spoken in Tanzania, and which we would have thought would have been the most likely source of these Afroasiatic forms in Hadza. This may therefore indicate that Hadza was in contact with another community of Afroasiatic speakers perhaps a very long time ago indeed. In light of these two observations, two among many across the entire Hadza language, maintaining that the Hadza are somehow unchanged over time and unaffected by interactions with the outside groups both today and in the past becomes rather hard to do. Next, I would like to talk about language documentation and description. This is an aspect of the work that I mentioned early on in this talk, but which I would like now to spend a bit more time talking about in terms of its transformative potential. Put very briefly, my colleague Richard Griscom and I trained 10 Hadza people in language documentation and description, and then provided salaries and continuing support for them to collect recordings in their own communities of linguistic and cultural materials. For around two years then, these local researchers created a rich multimedia documentation including songs, stories, personal histories, and discussions on a range of topics. Decisions on what to record, how to record it, and who to record were entirely left to community members. And I truly believe that what has come out of this is a unique collection of Hadza materials made by Hadza people. 
And finally, uh, we have some reflections on this process uh, from some of the local researchers, which I'll share now. Mm-hmm. Alafu nimefika sehemu inaitwa eh Choma Mbekao. Kwa mara ya kwanza walikuwa wana wasiwasi. Mm. Wakifikiri ni zile kazi kama za wageni wengine watalii ambao wanapita kurekodi kurekodi kwa namna ya maelekezo yao. Mm. kwamba uh, saa nyingine wanawatoa watu hapa wanawapeleka mahali wanawambia tunaenda tunawarekodi wakati mnafanya hivi hivi na hivi. Mm kwa vitu kama hivyo lakini hii kazi tuliwaambia si ya namna ile kuna tafiti ambazo watu wanakuja kuangalia mila na desturi za watu maisha ya watu hmm. lakini wanapotafiti hatujui wanakwenda kufanyaje hatujui zinasaidia nini kwa sababu labda hazirudi wakaona kwamba kumbe ni mwadhabi mwenzetu tu anafanya hii kazi sasa tunaogopa nini kwa hiyo wakawa huru sasa na wao kama wao walitumia hii kazi kama sasa kama darasa mm-hmm. la kutufundisha sisi watu vijana ni kama sasa tumeamsha moto mm-hmm. watu wamesha fikiri na kufikiri na kukumbuka na kukumbuka To conclude then, this talk has been about the Hadzabe and how outsiders, from unlucky linguists to evolutionary anthropologists to profiteers, have engaged with and represented them. I've shown in detail that current and ongoing exploitation of the Hadza people is rooted in research traditions which speak for, which instrumentalize, and which render the Hadza people timeless. And I call for change in research practices which affirm the Hadzabe as having a dynamic history, which value the Hadzabe by the simple virtue of them being humans, and which work to allow the Hadza people to speak for and represent themselves. I finished by offering some examples from my own practice, which I hope will begin this necessary transformation. I would like to thank Bonnie Sands for her contributions, which have helped us deconstruct the Hadza curse. I would also like to thank my colleague and friend Richard Griscom for his partnership during the Hadza documentation project, as well as for his thoughts and interventions when I first began thinking about these things. The quotes on slide 56 came from Claudia Brunner's project focused on epistemic violence and are included in this in, on her project's webpage. And uh, the quote on slide 40 was brought to my attention by a Twitter post from Anthony K. Webster. Also, thanks are due to participants in this Leiden Summer School's course, Critical Linguistic Field Methods. I'm sure they'll find that their contributions during that class and some of my own assertions here rhyme. I would also like to thank Anna Ballou and Sam Beer for their thoughts about exploitation, as well as their two solid weeks of social media street fighting. And finally, I would like to thank Hadza local researchers Bunga Paulo, Mariamu Anyawire, Ndeko Simon, Nange Chaka, Angela Sampson, Jacobo Lubumba, and Elizabeth Minja, as well as all of the Hadza people who've contributed their time, knowledge, and culture to the documentation project. Thank you, and here are my references.